I'm very excited. We have um, a few panel speakers with us today, so I'm going to introduce them uh, and uh, we can get started soon. So our first panelist, we have Dr. Charlene Gillen. Dr. Charlene will be joining us momentarily as well. And she is a GI medical oncologist and professor of medicine at BC Cancer in Vancouver. We also have with us Dr. Darren Brenner, who is an associate professor at the Departments of Oncology and Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. He is also an Armstrong investigator in molecular epidemiology. We also have with us today Dr. Michael Raphael, who is a medical oncologist at the Odette Cancer Center at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, and his practice is dedicated to the care of patients with gastrointestinal cancers. We also have with us today Filomena Servido Italiano, who is the president and CEO of Colorectal Cancer Resource and Action Network, who we've partnered today with for this talk. And she has dedicated the past 16 years to the cause of supporting, educating, and advocating on behalf of colorectal cancer patients and caregivers in honor of her father's memory. And we also have with us today, Louise Binder, who will be our panel session moderator. And Louise is a lawyer involved in the development of health policy and systemic treatment access for patients for 25 years. She co-founded the Canadian Treatment Action Council in 1996 and is presently a health policy consultant for the Save Your Skin Foundation. So with that, I'm very pleased to pass it over to our speakers and panelists for today's presentation. And welcome, Charlene. So we have all of our speakers on board today <laughs> and happy to pass it over to all of you for our presentation. Thank you so much. I'm uh, honored to, uh, to be facilitating this esteemed panel. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Toronto, which is, the, uh, which is located on the traditional territory of several nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit, and we thank them for sharing these lands with us. So let's begin at the beginning with Philomena um, and talking about patients. Um, Philomena, perhaps I was wondering if you could tell us from your work in colorectal cancer with patients over these many years, what you've noticed as regards the age of the people being diagnosed and at what stage uh, they are generally being diagnosed. Thanks very much, Louise. So first and foremost, before I actually get to the question, a very happy Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, my friends. Today is March 2nd, and we're very privileged to be able to participate in Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And thank you to Wellspring for allowing us the opportunity to chat a little bit about this growing crisis in Canada, the rising rates in young adult colorectal cancer. So to your question, Louise, when I first started this work back in August of 2006, I was facilitating a colorectal cancer information support group at Wellspring in Oakville, actually. And what we generally observed were colorectal cancer patients attending the group who were over the age of 50. We had patients in their 50s, their 60s, and their 70s. And back then, I can vividly recall no more than three patients who were participating in that group. And that support group actually had an attendance rate of about, oh, I would say 150 patients. And there were about maybe three patients who were in their 40s at that time, no more than three patients. But over the years, what started to happen and what we started to notice were there were a greater number of patients who were contacting us under the age of 50. So we started to have patients in their 40s contacting us, patients in their 30s and 20s, who were being diagnosed with advanced stage disease, either stage three or stage four disease. And this was very disturbing to us. The number of Canadians with advanced stage disease was starting to increase at an alarming rate. And 
their needs were becoming very significant. Today, we have patients, um, young patients, contacting us from across Canada on quasi a daily basis with predominantly stage four disease. And today, when you take a look at our support group meetings, stage three and stage four patients comprise approximately half of those numbers. It's, it's really disturbing. And if I, if, I, if I can say so, as a consequence of that stage four disease, the other challenging issue that we've noticed is when younger patients are diagnosed with advanced stage disease, they were also diagnosed with rather aggressive disease, really difficult to treat disease in comparison to their over 50 counterparts. And it's because of their tumor's molecular profiles, like difficult mutations, difficult alterations. So you can imagine how thrilled we were when we started to see precision medicines entering the equations and biomarker status now guiding those treatments for this particular subset of the patient population. Just thrilled. All right. And maybe you could tell us some of the key issues uh, that the patients who come to you in these earlier uh, ages uh, have faced uh, during their uh, experience in, in the cancer system. Yeah. So when these stage three or stage four patients contact us, we hear three recurrent themes over and over and over again. We hear similar stories. Um, young adult colorectal cancer patients tell us, how could I have been diagnosed with an old man's disease? No one told me that young Canadians could be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. How could this have happened to me? And this merely underscores the need for more awareness programs, more awareness efforts in Canada, for sure. The second recurrent theme that we hear is for patients who were experiencing symptoms, these patients were dismissing or disregarding those symptoms for quite some time, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. And they were dismissing those symptoms for a variety of different reasons, not the least of which were, these are young patients with young families who typically put their own needs last. Um, they could have been uh, experiencing vague symptoms that weren't presenting with immediate consequences. So it may have taken them quite some time to actually go and see their primary care physician, or they just didn't necessarily get around to going to see their primary care physician until their body, their body finally forced them to go and see their primary care physician. And finally, the third recurrent theme was for those patients who were experiencing symptoms that were consistent with colorectal cancer, those patients did get around to going to see their primary care physician or a, health, a healthcare professional in a timely manner, but those symptoms may have been dismissed or those symptoms were attributed to um, a benign condition and the symptoms may not necessarily have been resolved in a timely fashion and those patients may have been sent home. Additional visits to the primary care physician may have ensued, but those symptoms still were not resolved, only to have eventually ended up the patient at an ER visit with potentially a bowel obstruction or a bowel perforation, and the patient having been delivered a diagnosis of stage three or stage four disease. And the patient may have been devastated. And then eventually we end up receiving those support calls. And there they are looking for some information or some psychosocial support or just help because they feel like they're deer caught in headlights. So could you talk a little bit more uh, about your organization and, and the role that it's playing with, uh, with these patients? 
Yeah, for sure. So one of the very first things that we did to help address the crisis in Canada is CRAN created a, a, a patient advisory council whose council members past experience with the actual disease served as the inspiration for the development of meaningful, relevant patient programs for the under 50 patient population, knowing that younger patients undergo some very unique challenges, unlike their over 50 counterparts. Challenges like um, fertility, dating and intimacy, young families, employment, and so much more. We provide psychosocial support and educational programs for our patients. And, and we're currently actually in the process of finalizing the development of our early age onset colorectal cancer hub that offers evidence-based information on the disease, as well as a, a live chat room that's moderated by CRAN and Dr. Petra Wild Goose, who leads the Young Adult Colorectal Cancer Clinic at the Odette Cancer Center at Sunnybrook, so that any patient queries that are forwarded through that live chat room can be uh, responded to by various members, experts across the continuum of colorectal cancer care. We have online tools that can be accessed as well to learn a little bit more about the disease, um, such as my colorectal cancer consultant, where um, potential therapeutic options can be generated just by simply answering a series of 11 questions. And our colorectal cancer information support groups now are being organized according to the under 50 patient population versus the over 50 patient population. Additionally, with the help of our outstanding experts, such as those who have joined today, um, we, have, uh, we have actually, um, created or we've actually hosted in 2021 um, a series of symposia where we're, we're actually promoting research findings on risk factors, causes, precision medicines, and the management of early age onset colorectal cancer, the engagement of our valued primary care physician, physicians to help increase their index for uh, suspicion of colorectal cancer because they're on the front lines treating or, or trying to detect these colorectal cancers. And importantly, the engagement of all stakeholders to try to review uh, Canada's screening guidelines and the new evidence on early age onset colorectal cancer to determine if should we be having a thoughtful dialogue on including the 45 to 49 year olds as part of our provincial screening programs? Should this be taking place in Canada? There's a whole lot more that took place on our June 17th, 2021 symposium. And we're going to be hosting another symposium this fall, this time a two day symposium that's going to be organized according to patients and caregivers on day one, and our experts on day two. And the hope is this symposium will be able to promote much needed awareness and education on early age onset colorectal cancer in Canada. So it sounds to me as though you never get to sleep. Would that be probably about right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it sounds. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned Sunnybrook, so, so that's maybe a logical uh, uh, in, um, uh, opportunity to move to Michael, uh, who I know works at Sunnybrook uh, uh, with the patients that you've spoken about, some of them. Um, and, and perhaps, Michael, you could talk to us a little bit about, based on the experience that you've heard Philomena talk about, um, how does that match your experience treating these young, young patients? Yeah, thank you. So Philomena and I work very closely together through the work that's done at CCRAN. So we happen to share a lot of younger adults with cancer. So my experience really resonates and matches what Philomena was mentioning. And as I scanned the participant list, you know, thinking back to Philomena's comment about three people out of 150 who had young onset colorectal cancer, I can see more than three of my patients or family members who are under the age of 50 who are here today. So thank you for coming including some of whom I, I noticed they or their loved ones are getting chemotherapy as we speak. So lots of treatment that's ongoing for our patients. 
Um, and so my practice, unfortunately, is quite full of younger patients who have colorectal cancer of various stages. And as Phil Amina noted, unfortunately, these patients do tend to present with more advanced disease. And I think there's many factors for that, but one of the main factors is that there's not widespread knowledge that colorectal cancer can affect young people. And so time and time again, I see stories where patients presented with rectal bleeding and they were told, oh, you know, it's probably hemorrhoids or it's probably a fissure, don't worry about it. And it doesn't go away and it doesn't go away. Uh, and although that might've been the right first impression, when it doesn't go away, it should be investigated. And we typically aren't seeing that happening. Um, so I think education is a really important piece here and see CRAN or CRAN fills that, that gap. And I think that what we're seeing is that there's definitely a disproportionate rise in the incidence of young onset colorectal cancer. Um, I think that Darren might be speaking to that later, but what we're seeing is actually a paradox is that in higher income countries, there is a decline in the incidence of colorectal cancer overall, but there's actually an increase in those patients who are younger. And there was actually a recent study that was published that was quite interesting. Many of the patients will be aware of the IDEA collaboration, which looked at patients with stage three colon cancer and randomized them to three or six months of therapy. Um, and what they found when they went back and looked at that trial was that younger adults with cancer had a much different outcome than older patients. And they found that younger patients with stage three cancer had a much higher rate of relapse. And then despite the fact that they had better treatment adherence, so they actually received more of the therapies, they actually had worse outcomes, suggesting that as Philomena said, they have more aggressive disease biology. So what's very clear is that a young adult who's going through a diagnosis of colorectal cancer should not be treated the exact same way as an older adult who's going through the diagnosis. If we look at it very simply based off of the biology, it seems to be different. So it's a really, it's a challenge um, because we're seeing more and more patients with this devastating diagnosis that affects not only the patient, but their loved ones, their family, their friends. And events like this, I think are super important to help promote the message that young people get colorectal cancer too. We need to consider that diagnosis if people are presenting with symptoms suggestive of it and not just to uh, put it to the side because they're quote unquote too young to get cancer. So you mentioned that uh, you feel that, that there's definitely a need to treat this younger population differently than the older population. Maybe you could describe a little bit about the work uh, that you do in that regard or how you uh, at your clinic um, um, manage that. Yeah, so I, I think there's a few factors. So one is the treatment itself. And as of right now, there's no evidence that we have that a younger person with cancer should necessarily receive anything different in terms of the type of chemotherapy or the number of chemotherapy cycles that they receive. But when we look back at the data I was mentioning showing that younger patients have higher rates of relapse and they have worse outcomes, there does need to be more research to see if intensification of therapy in younger patients is something that would be beneficial. I think that what we need to do outside of the treatment of the cancer itself is provide age-specific support for patients who are diagnosed at a young age and for their family members. So Philomena touched on this, but in addition to having a diagnosis of cancer, which is devastating in any age, young patients have many specific challenges. These are often patients who are in the prime of their lives. They're getting partnered. They're having children. They've worked hard in their careers, and they're now at the point where they're starting to see some success. They may now actually be transitioning to providing care for their older parents who rely on them now. Um, and these are challenges that are not necessarily seen in the older population, in addition to the things like Philomena mentioned, like fertility, intimacy, relationships. And they have unique challenges, so they require unique supports. And so at Sunnybrook, we do have a specific young adults with colorectal cancer clinic. So uh, Dr. Wild Goose is a family physician who has a special interest in this. She's also a surgical assistant who actually goes and helps out in the operating room. And so she really can follow these patients from diagnosis through surgery, through treatment. Um, and by getting a concentrated experience with these younger population of patients, she has a wealth of knowledge about their specific needs and how can she can support them. We have Dr. Ashamala, who, who most people in this call will know is a fantastic surgeon um, and who really provides a lot of teaching and education and extra time to discuss with patients and their families about the diagnosis, the implications of the surgery, the effect it will have on their quality of life and future bowel function. Um, and then there's myself among other oncologists who, who are really dedicated to this population of patients, um, recognizing that 
right now we don't yet have the evidence to necessarily treat them any differently in terms of the therapies or the number of cycles, but that evidence needs to be explored further. Um, and just recognizing that all those other factors that I, that I spoke about before require consideration to make sure that you're treating the holistic patient and their family, as opposed to just some random person with a colon cancer diagnosis. Mm. And, and so based on your experience, do you have some specific recommendations uh, broadly that uh, would enhance support for this population for others who are treating them and, and others in the, in the healthcare system? Yeah, I, th I think I would break it down into to two, two aspects. So one is in the prevention aspect. And the number one thing there is education, education, education. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of mixed evidence as to the utility of colonoscopies for colorectal cancer screening, especially when you get into the younger populations. But we need more research. We need more advocacy. We need to have the education that if you have symptoms, you need to see your doctor and your doctor should take these seriously and investigate. You know, if you're talking about screening, that's one thing, but there's no question if someone presents with a symptom of bleeding, pain, discomfort, change in their bowel habits, they're no longer in the realm of screening, they're in the realm of diagnosis, and they need an investigation, which is a colonoscopy to figure that out ASAP. And so education is the most important part, both to patients, physicians, family members uh, in the preventive setting. And then in the treatment setting, we definitely need to have focused clinics for patients who have a diagnosis of colorectal cancer at a younger age, because they may require those extra supports, like seeing specifically a physician who has expertise in younger adults with cancer. They often need to see special psychiatrists or psychosocial oncologists who can address their specific emotional and mental health care needs. They may have fertility issues that require them to see reproductive endocrinologists or specialists to talk to them about their fertility preservation or hormonal therapy if they're going early into menopause or sperm banking and all these sorts of things that are important for our patients. And so I think it's just about building a team of experts so that everyone contribute their small little piece uh, to the puzzle that makes these patients have the best optimal care that they can get. And and. How do we, where are the best places for that sort of education to take place? Is it in the medical schools or, or where, how do we kind of do that uh, practically? Uh, yeah, the, the knowledge translation piece is the hardest part uh, because I think that the motivated people who are on this webinar right now are the ones who already know about this, you know, and so by telling people about this, hopefully they can go and tell their friends and their family. But I do think it's about promotion like CRAN does on social media, by advertising at conferences, um, by working with family doctors, um, by spreading the message. Um, because I think that sometimes, whether it's here or on social media, we, we preach to the converted, we're speaking in our echo chambers of everyone who's like-minded, who understands that this is an important issue and that we need to do more about it. So we have to do better to reach the broader public to make this message known so that we don't leave any of these patients behind. Thank you. So Charlene, I know if I can turn to you now, um, uh, I know that you also are treating these populations. Um, what, uh, why do you think uh, they're diagnosed uh, so late and, and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, treated so late? And, and what would you, what's been your experience? Uh, thank you, Louise. So first, I, I thank you again to uh, Wellspring and to CCRAN for uh, including me in this webinar. It, you know, the it's timely, you know, it's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Phil, I'm wearing blue, did you notice? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's also, you know, the word crisis was used in the, in this, as we presented this webinar. And, you know, uh, it's an appropriate, um, sounding of, an, of the alarm, because I think for the last two decades, as Michael really alluded to, you know, we, it's, there's this increasing recognition of this shifting epidemiology of colorectal cancer. And, you know, when I trained, you know, over 20 years ago, it was, you know, all our patients were, you know, in their late 60s, early 70s, typically. Um, and, you know, as you get, as you get older, uh, you start to see patients who are younger than you. And, <laughs> and I know I've gotten older, but not that much older. Um, so, so what's, you know, just at a personal level, it's just, it's gut-wrenching really to, you know, to, to 
see p patients who are, you know, in their 40s, you know, you know, as again, as Michael said, kind of juggling many responsibilities at that time in their life, uh, and then to be dealt with this diagnosis. It's also, I would say, an opportunity because these are highly motivated patients. Uh, and I feel like our patients are going to lead the charge here in terms of raising, uh, you know, the awareness. The, my younger patients are my most informed kind of coming in with all this information, really wanting to be empowered. And, and I think that that uh, is a shift in, in the landscape of colorectal cancer advocacy that I hope will lead to, to much more um, rapid adoption of the knowledge translation that Michael's talking about. So, so yeah, in my practice, I can separate from the epidemiologic evidence, which is very clear, you know, there are there's data both, you know, and our group in BC has done that, led also by a uh, fantastic researcher, Dr. Mary Devera, who's uh, who is a, a young early onset colorectal cancer survivor, uh, looking at epi shifting epidemiology of colorectal cancer. And, you know, we see maybe about 30% of new cases of colorectal cancer now under age 50, right? And, um, you know, <laughs> When, when I turned 50 a few years ago, um, you know, I, I, there was, you know, people gave me these cards that said time to get a colonoscopy, right? And I feel like those cards have to be age 40 now. Like, I feel like we have to shift that mindset where we think, oh, it's, you know, I don't have to worry about any of this stuff until I'm older. Um, and, and that is also kind of, you know, the public awareness piece. I think patients are their own best personal advocates. If you go to your doctor and you have persistent symptoms and your physician might, you know, because a lot of times they are benign, may, may dismiss it, but they persist. Do not hesitate to push the needle to ask the question and ask for, you know, further testing. Um, you know, oftentimes, Louise, you mentioned, you know, these patients, our patients are diagnosed late and why does that happen? And I think we all know why, you know, it's because you know, we're not thinking cancer in the primary care setting in our younger patients. And, uh, and I think we, it's, that has to change. And the data is very clear. So, so if that is true, and, and that seems to be supported by our previous speakers as well, that um, what is it then that we need to do kind of systemically um, to change the landscape so that people are thinking about this, are therefore getting diagnosed early enough and are getting treated early enough? What would be some of your recommendations? So I think, I think um, you know, obviously the work that Phil is doing with CCRAN in terms of raising awareness at a patient level, empowering patients, giving them the tools uh, to, for advocacy is very important. Uh, I often say that you know, for a change in health policy, no one listens to physicians. <laughs> True, it's true. The, the, the true power influencers listen to patients and the public, and that voice is, is very strong. Um, at, as academics and as an oncologist, I think we have to do, continue to do our part to really promote research. Uh, we talked a bit about sort of the, um, the psychosocial sort of unique aspects around a young onset colorectal cancer, you know, fertility and livelihood and financial constraints. And, um, and that has to, those supports need to be, there has to be capacity in our healthcare system to support those needs for patients. Uh, and at the same time, from a research lens, you know, from a precision oncology lens, right now we kind of, we treat patients the same. Right, we don't we don't use that age factor as a discriminator in terms of predictive or you know factors for treatment, and perhaps we should perhaps we should be doing more in terms of understanding the unique biology of early onset colorectal cancer and tailoring treatment accordingly. And that's on us as a research community to really push that agenda. Um, so it kind of takes it's a multi pronged uh, approach, but. Uh, I'm, I've been in oncology for 20 years because I'm an optimist by nature. I think you have to be to be in this, in this line of work. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to make real change in, in, this, in this particular uh, population of early onset colorectal cancer. 
Well, um, thank you. I've actually also uh, turned 50, not so many thousands of years ago myself. And uh, it, there's no question that there's quite a difference in the way, in perspective, um, depending on one's age. Um, although I'd like to think we're all young at heart it's, to some extent. But what would you say about treating these younger patients as a result of that um, uh, in, in your experience? So, uh, so, you know, as an oncologist, I think, you know, we all want to um, approach patients at a very personal level, like tailored treatment to what their needs are. And I think, I think from a pure treatment perspective, I, I, I don't feel like that's the, that's the big challenge for me. I think in my work environment, uh, the challenge for me is trying to provide them the additional support. And so I think in the US, some centers have done a very good job of having dedicated clinics for early onset colorectal cancer, really a whole infrastructure and a team-based approach to, to meeting the unique needs of, of that patient population. Uh, and, you know, and work is being done. Sunnybrook, I think, is at the forefront in Canada, really with driving that agenda. But uh, that's something that needs to be, that capacity needs to be built you know, across the country and, and where I practice in BC, you know, despite everyone's best efforts, we don't have, you know, we don't have that in place. Um, and again, I think it's something that uh, is really valuable for patients. They need a team. Yes, one of the things we certainly have learned, uh, you must have known I'd come to the pandemic eventually, because everybody comes to the pandemic eventually. Um, I mean, we knew that there were big cracks in these, in all of our systems, those of us who are working at it day to day um, before the pandemic. And of course, those have been exposed to the general public and exacerbated um, as a result. And two of the echo pandemics that are talked about certainly are oncology and mental health. And I kind of wonder about the connection of those um, for these younger people, because we do hear so much about how younger people have been so profoundly impacted uh, by this pandemic. Yeah, I, I, it's true. You know, it's the pandemic has maybe unmasked problems that already existed, as you said. Um, you know, I, every time I meet a patient now, I'm like, I really tell them, look, this, I, we, this is a team, we're a team. So I need you to do this, this, this. And I need, you know, if you don't get a call about this appointment, call back. If you don't, like, I, I feel that um, to bridge that gap before we are able to build back better, which we have to, uh, the onus is on us on the front lines. Uh, and that includes us as care providers and also our patients. So I, I get my patients involved in like in booking appointments, calling them like you, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, things fall through the cracks and in the pandemic that has been an issue. And sometimes I'll have really well-intentioned patients being two patients. They'll like come back to me a month later and they're like, Oh, no one called me. And I'm like, Oh, no, you know, just poke, poke, poke. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's unfortunate, honestly. I, 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 I wish I could offer that kind of service to my patients where we will take care of it all. Um, and, uh, and, but I think I have to also say that, again, our younger patients, they, they want to do it. They want to get in there. And I think that's what Phil is seeing in the patients she's connecting with as well, is that the, they are reaching out, they're trying to find networks, they are online, they're connecting with a lot of, you know, media groups, they're bringing me information about trials. I learn a lot from my young patients. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so um, it's, 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 a, it's a change, but I'm hoping it's a, it's a change that's progress. Well, I would certainly say as a longtime patient, um, uh, who's <laughs> pushes and shoves all the time, as my doctors will tell you, um, it, you know, if you give people permission to do that, uh, it's really important. I, I, you know, some of us do it by nature, but some of us will do it by nurture. So if you nurture that in your patients, uh, I think that's a wonderful thing uh, to do. And then they don't feel badly if yeah. they're doing it. You know, I never feel badly about any of it, but some people certainly do. It's true. So. Yeah. Some people feel like, oh, they're like, oh, I didn't want to be pushy or something. And I said, I respect that, but um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
That's right. That's right. So Darren, bring us home <laughs> and uh, tell us, please, um, a bit based on your experience and what you've heard from the other panelists. What has your research in, in epidemiology concluded about the experience of young people with colorectal cancer? I want to echo thanks for the organization of this um, session and for the invitation. So one of the, the research hats that I wear is as the co-chair for the Community Cancer Statistics Committee, where I oversee the generation of sort of the national estimates for the cancer statistics. And so I get a pretty detailed landscape around cancer diagnosis trends in the country. And this trend among early onset colorectal cancer patients is the fastest changing trend for any major cancer site. Uh, for any age group. So to me, as an epidemiologist, it's very um, much of interest to see where we have such a uh, strong success in terms of prevention of colorectal cancer through screening, but then a potential failure of the system if we don't address this rising trend. So um, really from a research perspective, I think what we've learned working across the cancer control spectrum from prevention studies all the way through treatment and management, I think the key word really is uncertainty, uncertainty in the evidence base. We know that this uncertainty really is false with patients and clinicians as well, but we're working hard, uh, working collaboratively towards uh, finding clarity and solutions. So from a prevention perspective, we're investigating potential risk factors that are unique to this generation. So uh, I'm trying to understand, as Michael alluded to, there is something going on in this population in Western countries trying to understand is something environmental, are there toxic exposures, lifestyle patterns, differences, things uh, that are unique to the population. As Michael and Charlie both noted, we're seeing uh, you know, increasing trends in up two to 300% higher rates uh, in generations born sort of post-1970. So very much alarming. Uh, we're trying to work with some uh, leaders in the provincial screening programs to understand the impact of changing the guidelines because uh, I think that's really the, the main question here. Um, trying to understand this uh, impact of the system to change this, as we said, the sort of golden line of 19, uh, 50 years of age, what would be that impact? Uh, we're finally we're trying to work to understand uh, some of that un uncertainty around the management of disease. What are the optimal treatment strategies and how do we use data to answer those questions? And so we're conducting a few studies using real world data in collaboration with um, clinicians like Dr. Gill and other medical oncologists to try to understand uh, what works best uh, using real patient data from Canada um, with the end goal to try to reduce that uncertainty for both patients, families, and clinicians. And really the hope of all of this research collaboratively is that then we can generate the materials, tools, and really aim towards policy recommendations to try to uh, impact this, this dramatic rise in rates that we see more so than any other cancer site in any age group. So that's, uh, that, that brings me to the question of recommendations. And, uh, and uh, to, to the extent that you have some at this point, even if they're preliminary and we still do have many uncertainties, um, what would be some of those recommendations you would have to policymakers and to other healthcare stakeholders in a, on a, a, a population base? base? Great question. Um, and so certainly additional research is needed for definitive answers, but I think there's some things that we can really try to tackle right away. First and most importantly is that urgent need to review the current screening recommendations in light of the new evidence of the trends that are changing so fast. We've actually just took a sneak peek for the most recent data years, and it's also continues to increase. So uh, that has not plateaued and continues to rise. So for example, the US Preventative Services Task Force, they recently changed their recommendations to include 45 to 49 year olds, uh, but really with the differences and nuances in the Canadian and more specifically the provincial system, that we have to have the data to understand what a change like that would do in terms of system capacity, uh, what would be the impact on patients, wait times, physicians, facilities, the services, and try to balance those costs. Uh, so really the, there is a lot of need for support and funding from the provincial and federal levels for this work. It's I think the most important question to get at right away. But actually, uh, the sort of one silver lining of the COVID-19 issue is that it's impacted screening programs, so there's already going to be a reevaluation of how we triage patients through the screening process and largely leaning towards low-cost tests like the fecal and the chemical test. So it could be evaluated at the same time, lowering the positivity thresholds for those tests and broadening the age group to try to catch some of those additional patients. So potential opportunity. Uh, perhaps 
not from a policy perspective, but just from a sort of an awareness perspective. I think uh, Michael alluded on this as well, that family physicians really need to focus on initiating discussions uh, with patients about symptoms, uh, if asked about family history, and sort of make that part of routine clinical care. Um, and really, specifically when uh, we see the presence of symptoms of potential colorectal cancer, changes in bowel habits, rectal bleeding, unexplained anemia. Um, we know that we've, there's been a few patient surveys in Canada that suggest that symptoms are often disregarded by these younger patients or misdiagnosed by the patients. And so hopefully uh, this can be sort of something that we're, we can address collaboratively as, as a research community. And to this point, we've been working with Phil and others uh, at, at, on, from C. Grant on a recommendation note for CMA to sort of raise this awareness uh, to submit to CMAJ. So um, I think those are sort of the two main areas we can focus on recommendations for policy. So Charlene mentioned that uh, her younger patients are pretty gung-ho gang. And, uh, and you've mentioned that uh, screening uh, uh, recommendations need, uh, need updating. So what should her gung-ho gang be doing uh, to help, uh, to help uh, policymakers understand that uh, people really are watching what they're doing in that area and get them to do it? Who should, be, who should, who should her gang be writing to? Uh, provincial health authority, uh, ministers, or deputy ministers, um, really, because we need investment to support the work to do those cost effectiveness and do the evaluations. And, and in the light of the current situation with COVID, it hasn't reached a priority triage level that it needs to be uh, so that we can get ahead of the, the curve, ahead of the wave, um, to, and, and then sort of try to, to quell the future trends for early onset patients. So I think that getting active, getting vocal, and making it sort of focused towards your provincial governments are is really where the money has to come from to help change those systems because they at the end have to say yes to change the guidelines within each province. Well, of course, we have a couple of uh, elections coming up this year in a couple of provinces, like for, for instance, Ontario and Quebec. So maybe that would be uh, good places to start. Just suggesting, not just suggesting. <laughs> so thank you. Please, oh, Charlene, I, yeah. Sorry, just, to, just a follow-up comment to that, because I think it's it's so important. Um, so someone, one of the attendees in the chat has very generously shared their personal story about how they had, you know, asked for further investigation and sort of it didn't happen. And, you know, there's the part of me that just, that just, it hurts to, you know, I don't want to suggest that the 100% onus needs to be on patients. Obviously, we need to, engage and educate our primary care providers more to raise awareness. But I, like I said, I think there's sort of synergy to that approach where patient awareness and advocacy can very nicely complement increased education among primary care providers. But to the point about, you know, writing to your, your Minister of Health, the truth is that the business case is very clear for prevention over treatment. And so, you know, initially the resistance is always, oh, how are we going to get the capacity and how are we going to pay for this? But the, the reality is that not only at a patient level, but at a system level, preventing a cancer or detecting a cancer early in an early stage with curable, by far, hands down, is the business decision, the smart business decision for a public health system. Um, so, you know, I, to me, it's, you know, I know I'm biased, but it's a no brainer. <laughs> you're not biased uh you just don't understand that in politics everybody seems to get voted for um for for uh, getting the horses back in the barn rather than keeping them in the barn before they get out any of that and that's just my opinion i'm not speaking on behalf of anybody else here but it's something to think about uh, how do we convince our politicians that we're actually voting for them for what they didn't do rather than what they did do just just a way of thinking about it in a different way you know because prevention is really about what you didn't do in a sense what you stopped from happening rather than what you you know tried to rein in after <laughs> the worst has happened so uh it's it's an interesting political dynamic that goes on there uh, but i agree with you if the dog you know if you want to sharpen your pencil 
it's pretty easy to figure out how to save that money and where the money's really saved for sure. So we wanted to give a few minutes for our uh, Q and A, and I think that uh, Vanessa, you're going to manage that for us. Yes, so I will jump into that. But before that, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers here today and Louise yourself for moderating so well. I think there was so many, so much valuable experience and knowledge that was shared. So truly just a big, big thank you for your time today. And I can see the passion when you are speaking about these cases, how really passionate you are about you know, supporting these younger folks that are, do have the colorectal cancer. So I admire and appreciate your time and your passion and your contributions to this field as well. So I thank you for that. And I'll jump into uh, the questions. I see a few that we have here. So our first one is, uh, if, these, if these patients require surgery resulting with a, col a col colostomy, are they seen early before surgery by an ostomy nurse? And if a colostomy is required, are they referred to the ostomy association so that they can speak with other colostomy patients? And I'll open the floor to anyone, anyone can answer. I can answer that. Well, at Sunnybrook, we've got an amazing nurse, uh, advanced practice nurse named Sukana, who is the ostomy nurse. And she also happens to be a wound care practitioner nurse. She sees every single patient who's going to have an ostomy before surgery to discuss with them about uh, the procedure, to show them the appliances, to connect them with resources. Um, and then she'll see them again ad hoc on any appointment if there's trouble with leaking, appliances not fitting. Because I can tell you, she knows infinitely more than I do. When people ask about flanges and sizes and tape and stuff, I don't know what's going on. So yeah, Sukhana is amazing. She sees everyone before. And I'm not sure if that's routine at other cancer centers, but... Yeah, we have that great resource here. Perfect, thank you for that. So I don't think- I, I was just gonna add to that. The, oh. um, the, the and the shout out for, the, for provincial ostomy associations. I've had a lot of uh, patients who've separate from within the surgical clinics and the ostomy nurse to support that's provided. That peer-to-peer uh, -peer support is very helpful. You know, patients living with ostomies uh, learn how, you know how to how to manage a lot of the issues and that shared learning I think is really helpful for patients so I would encourage connecting with that those groups as well thank you for that I echo that as well I do agree we see at Wellspring too the individuals who have uh, peer support they really do find so much value in connecting with someone who has that shared experience so I'm gonna jump into our next question. How do oncologists keep up to date with the latest research trials while managing an ever increasing number of patients? And how do patients keep appraised of developments in this space? I feel like there are patients who, and caregivers who want to know this research, what's up to date, but they struggle with finding and getting access to that information. So what are your thoughts on that? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, the good news is that the landscape is changing at a pace where there is a lot of information coming, and we, you know, we we are, you know, hopeful that that translates into progress and and better outcomes for our patients. The challenging flip side is that it's a lot of it's a lot of information, and um, you know, my recommend, like, you know, I I have the luxury of treating a very narrow scope within oncology as well. So, um, and even then it's a struggle to make sure you stay up to date with, you know, all the advances that are coming. I think at a patient level, you know, the first place would be starting at patient directed um, websites. So for example, uh, you know, I know CRAN is trying to really help create educational platforms that are directed for patients can, and then once you kind of get past that, you can, you know, try to delve into the more of the primary source literature. Um, other bigger medical oncology solutions like ASCO has a whole patient platform, ESMO has a whole patient platform. Um, I think that's a start, a reasonable starting point. It can be overwhelming and um, uh, it's, you know, I, I don't know the answer, but I would just sort of say start with small bits of information to understand the landscape and try to tailor the information to your particular situation as well. And again, trying to, you know, share that with your, with your care providers, whether it's your family doctor or your oncologist 
to, to know if that's pertinent to your case. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I'm also like Charmaine in that I only treat GI cancers and even within that, I only treat four different types of GI cancer. So it's, it's a bit lucky that um, we have the opportunity to subspecialize. And also we do our research in this area as well. So that, that helps, but the pace of information is fast changing. It's hard even with a subspecialist like this to keep up with all the information. And it must be extraordinarily hard for our colleagues in the community who have to treat so many different types of cancer. I would just caution that there's two types of evidence in my mind, broadly speaking. There's good evidence and there's bad evidence. Um, and we need to be mindful that there's a lot of things that are published, a lot of papers that are written that may fall into the bad evidence category, is that it wasn't a robustly done study, there wasn't appropriate controls, it's suggesting a crazy effect sizes for treatments. Um, and then I guess there's one perhaps third category, which is I would call more thought-provoking research, um, in that those would be really early phase studies, like phase one and phase two studies that seem promising, or those retrospective studies that seem like they're promising things, but it's important, and I spend a lot of time educating my patients that one, you know, quote unquote positive study shouldn't change our practice necessarily. And we really have to look at the evidence because just because this one study suggested that this immunotherapy is helpful in this population. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean it actually is. So teasing out good evidence, bad evidence, and evidence that should be thought-provoking is a full-time job in and of itself. And it's terribly difficult for oncologists, for scientists, and for patients and families as well. And so feel free to ask your doctor, you know, and, and I, I commonly tell patients, like if it's a really busy clinic, I'll say, you know, it's a really big question. Let's set, us, let's set aside some time to talk about that in a bit more detail after I've read that paper. Uh, maybe it's not today's the best time. So I think it's important to ask and the, the worst that the oncologist can tell you is, hey, like I don't think that's ready for prime time yet. Um, Anita, if I may, I, I know the question was geared towards medical oncologists and rightfully so, but what it is that we're doing at CRAN more and more every day with the help of our very generous uh, medical oncologists is, the information that we're providing our early age onset colorectal cancer patients is very evidence-based. Um, as a result of our experts reviewing our information first and foremost, but secondly, what we're doing is on a monthly basis, as a result of performing comprehensive and systematic reviews of the literature, we are providing um, treatment and clinical research updates according to treatment modality because we're receiving a greater number of requests from our young patient population to access this research-based information. And we're providing it on our website on a monthly basis. Secondly, patients, young patients are wanting to access this research-based information um, on the management of their disease. So this is predominantly the reason why we created My Colorectal Cancer Consultant, which is essentially an online tool that allows patient to, patients to complete 11 questions and based on their biomarker information will permit the generation of a 35 page report that will once again generate potential treatment options, predominantly for the management of advanced colorectal cancer, giving them systemic therapies. And this has all been born out of a need for advanced colorectal cancer patients to gain access to this information because we kept repeatedly being, we kept repeatedly receiving this, these types of queries. Please help us gain access to this information. And it was reviewed by four experts across Canada. So in keeping with that question, this is what we've been forced to do. We were obliged to do it. And all of the information on our website is evidence-based. I think that's perfect. And again, like I think the caregivers and patients and anyone who is navigating this disease, they just want that information. And I think it's so helpful that there's several different avenues and specifying the types of evidence that you should be looking for is very helpful. So our next question, um, can you speak to the role of CT DNA testing in terms of predicting disease progress and recurrence? I can, I can speak to that. So this idea of um, 
a detection of circulating tumor DNA through a blood sample, sometimes referred to as a, a liquid biopsy, is a uh, emerging and very promising technology. Um, I think the application in colorectal cancer seems to be, you know, most promising in this concept of uh, what we call minimal residual disease. So there's, you know, when we have curatively, with curative intent, treated, let's say, a colorectal cancer with surgery, and do scans and blood work and don't, you know, like usual blood work and don't see any evidence of cancer. We know that there, there is a risk that the cancer may still come back because there is some undetectable residual disease. And so uh, there is more and more evidence that circulating tumor DNA, a blood sample taken, let's say four weeks after surgery, can be very, um, can be predictive where if it's positive, uh, we know that the likelihood of recurrence is much greater. And if it's negative, we know that the likelihood of recurrence is much lower. So it, so it can really help what we call risk stratify for recurrence in colorectal cancer. Um, the challenge is that in, we don't have in Canada a Health Canada approved or a commercially available uh, CT DNA test. There are, that's, that has been validated for the use of minimal residual disease. There are um, um, testing, uh, I guess, small companies that are trying to kind of get into the space within Canada. Um, so we're kind of in this like gray zone where we, we, this data is coming up. And I think as a clinician, I would want to be able to have that for my patients after they've had surgery. I think it can be very helpful, but it's not quite, I think, ready for prime time in Canada. But if you're at a center where they, maybe they have a study that is looking at the use of ctDNA. In Vancouver, we have a few different studies that are looking at that after uh, surgery for early stage colorectal cancer. I would highly endorse, you know, considering those studies. Thank you for that. So our, our next question, I know this might, we might not be able to answer it uh, to the most accurate as cancer does have a fairly different number of causes and unknown ones as well, but there was a question on, do we know the cause of early onset colorectal cancer? I can answer. Yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Darren, go ahead, please. You haven't had a chance to speak yet. Oh, I was just going to suggest that um, that is indeed correct. We don't know the exact cause of any particular cancer. We can just study sort of risk factor profiles. Um, but what we know when we look at a synthesis of the evidence, um, the strongest risk factor is the family history of disease, first degree relatives. And, having previous colorectal cancer. Uh, there's a suggestion of a few risk factors, things like hyperlipidemia, uh, metabolic syndrome, ulcerative colitis, chronic kidney disease. But some of those diseases have sort of very limited evidence bases. And this gets back to what Michael was speaking around that the more studies we see and the more sort of that point in the same direction, things like hyperlipidemia, uh, first degree relative status, uh, excess body size, and there's some suggestion for some other lifestyle factors. Uh, but this is a really a fast emerging area of research and there's quite a few uh, potential sources of risk that are being evaluated, things like uh, exposure to antibiotics earlier in life, uh, certain occupational exposures, and then sort of changes in the way we, we have are starting to live with sitting and on phones all the time and things like that that are really in the early stages of being evaluated, but those are starting to be, uh, some of those studies are starting to come out now. But what we know consistently, first degree relatives, and then a few other um, health items. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? I know you were going to jump in earlier. No, I, I would say that in addition to the risk factors that Darren mentioned, like the lifestyle risk factors, increasing age, um, there are genetic risk factors. So we have familial syndrome, like Lynch syndrome being the most common one. That to the question in the chat, you now every patient in Ontario has their tumor screened for the mismatch repair proteins as a screen for Lynch syndrome. But unfortunately for the majority of other patients with cancer, we just don't have any idea. Um, we chalk it up to bad luck right now, but that's just our excuse because we just don't have the data yet. Hopefully in 20 years, we'll be able to explain all of those reasons with more scientific answers. Thank you for that. So I see another question here. Are the genomic profiles different between early and late onset colorectal patients? And are there any clinical trials focusing on early onset colorectal patients? Um, yeah, so I, I think the, the evolving evidence suggests that there are different genomic profiles. 
why someone who's young gets colorectal cancer, there's probably a different molecular mechanism as opposed to someone who's older. Um, and that's suggested by some of the studies that, that I posted in the, the chat there and referenced earlier on. But the exact details we don't really understand. You know, so we, we know that there's differences in stage. We know that the younger patients are more likely to have mucinous type tumors. We know that there's a differential distribution of some of the RAS and RAF mutations that exist. Um, and certainly younger patients are more likely to have Lynch syndrome, so they're more likely to have hepatocyclic cancers as well. Um, but our knowledge is very, very, very preliminary. There's a lot more work to do to better understand, actually. Thank you for that. So I think we have about uh, two more questions. Um, hopefully I'm not running a little too over time. I just wanna make sure I know these questions are important as well. So what is the latest research on the use of SBRT to treat few lung nodules as a result of lung metastases? Is surgery more fav favorable or is SBRT equally effective? Sure, it's a specific question. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the answer is that, again, unfortunately, nobody knows. Um, surgical removal of a tumor is a definitive treatment for cancer. Um, it's taken out of the body, so that tumor is no longer possible to regrow in that area. So it, it does depend. If you have a very small peripheral tumor that could be wedged out by a surgeon very easily, then surgery is usually preferred. If you have multiple places of tumor that are deeper, that would require a lobectomy, and that could have more impact on your lung function, um, then SBRT is usually used. Most of the evidence that we have in this area is actually extrapolated from the lung cancer population, uh, where radiation and surgery is more often used. And the evidence would suggest that if you have a very, very small tumor, a stage one tumor, SBRT and surgery have essentially equivalent local control rates in terms of preventing the cancer from coming back in that area. But extrapolating to the colon cancer population, we just don't know. So I would summarize it as saying surgery, if possible, both for patient and tumor related factors, but sometimes it's not possible and you need to have SBRT. And in many patients, you need to have a combination of both. Dr. Rafel, are there any differences in the clinical practice guidelines from one provincial jurisdiction to another in Canada when it comes to the use of SBRD to treat those colorectal metastases to the lung? Um, I'm not aware of any differences in the guidelines. Um, um, the, the difference probably comes down to local practice patterns and what you have available. Um, and so it's always ideal if you have both options. So if you have access to both a thoracic surgeon and a radiation oncologist who practices SBRT, now that's becoming increasingly common. It used to be just at very highly specialized centers. Um, but at this point in time, like for example, at Sunnybrook, if I had a patient with colorectal cancer with a lung metastases, uh, and it was um, possibly amenable to surgery or radiation, I would send them to both, get the expertise from both, and have them hear from the actual experts who understand the techniques, the side effects, and the risks a lot more than I do, uh, to give us a, a sense of which they think is the best treatment, and then ultimately up to the patient and family to identify which, is treat which treatment is more in line with their risk profile. All right, thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll take one more uh, question um, before we wrap up. Does the ostomy association take donations of unused ostomy supplies? Um, that is a question that if I received, I would say, please ask Sukina because I have no, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've actually received this question repeatedly, Benita, and we do have patients who you know, have temporary um, ileostomies, for example, and have an abundant um, supply of their ostomy supplies and would like very much to donate those supplies. Um, to my knowledge, so I, I, I shouldn't say this, I, I don't know. I really don't know. However, what we do do is we take those supplies, those leftover supplies, and we do donate them to other patients who are going to be receiving temporary ileostomies or do have ileostomies, and they are very happy to receive them. That's what we end up doing with those supplies. And, and typically we'll hook up <laughs> uh, patients who are going to be um, receiving a temporary ileostomy or a permanent stoma, for example, and um, pair them up with a patient who has received an ileostomy or a permanent stoma, for example, so that they can become well acquainted with what the journey is going to be. And that becomes very helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for that. So I think we'll wrap up our question uh, period with that. And just before, again, just before we do sign off, I just wanted to say thank you so much to each and every one of you for your time today and for your contribution contributions and sharing all the knowledge that you did. I know that our population will find this information so, so very valuable. And I don't know if anyone had any final comments before we do sign off, please feel free to, to share. Well, I, I, just as the facilitator, I'd like to say thank you very much to Wellspring um, for, um, for supporting uh, this important conversation. And, uh, and of course, to all of the panelists who uh, put up with my questions that were probably <laughs> not that useful, but you got the information out nonetheless. And so uh, I, I just think it's, it's wonderful. And, and it's wonderful to see um, patient organizations really um, strongly engaged, as everybody would know, that uh, that's very dear to my heart, as well as uh, the wonderful teamwork that seems to um, have developed in this area to the between the doctors uh, and the patient organizations and their patients. Uh, that's that's the tri that's the triumvirate that that uh, certainly I think really brings the best um, for the patients. So thank you so much from my perspective. Yeah, Vanita, I was essentially going to thank Wellspring for allowing us the opportunity to chat today. I was going to thank our experts, our very valued experts, for taking time out of their very busy schedules to join us today. We're very grateful. And to Louise Binder for having done such an exceptional job moderating today. Thank you very much, Louise. And of course, to all our participants for having joined. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So with that, I just wanted to thank again, like Philomena said, thank you everyone for attending today. We do hope that you found the information uh, very valuable and it gives you some next steps on um, empowering yourself to do what you know you need and is best for you in this journey. So we hope you take away so much from this session and we'll wrap it up and wishing everyone a safe and happy rest of your day and take care everyone and thank you again for showing up today and your time. All right, take care. <laughs>